All right. So remember, uh, the test is up. Remember all the stipulations, though. Uh, when you go to access that test, your study time has officially ended. Yeah. <laughs> so there is a page attached at the back that will help you with some rules for convergence of series, some of the tests that we had, all of the tests that we ever came up with for convergence of series. What won't be up here on that sheet are kind of some of the basic uh, power series that we came up with, like the geometric, sine, cosine, logarithm, exponential. So you really should study up on that for sure. We'll spend a little bit of time kind of reviewing tomorrow, asking, uh, you know, asking and answering questions and whatnot. Uh, but that thing is due by class time on Monday, either uh, handing it in paper form or uploading that thing to Canvas in some kind of electronic scan or picture format or something. Okay. But again, I said this last time, but I would prefer that, that if you do uh, upload pictures, that, that it be some uh, standard format of some kind. Uh, for instance, if you use an iPhone, I think by default, the the file format is something that I would have to use some kind of conversion tool on the internet to, to convert those things. So if you could just do that additional step for me, that'd be great. Uh, I mean, I could do it, but if I if everybody uploaded their iPhone pictures, then I would have to do that for everyone, right? Um, so convert it to like a you know JPEG or or a PNG or whatever, right? Um, that would be a good a good way to go. Uh, I wanted to show. So any questions on that before we before we kind of jump in and look at some things? Any questions? So I wanted to uh, I wanted to show you this. I was trying to get this to work yesterday and I couldn't I couldn't get it to work for some reason, but then I it arbitrarily decided to work all of a sudden. I mean that's kind of, that's the thing with some of these freeware programs is sometimes they do exactly what you want them to do. And other times they do exactly the opposite of what you're trying to get them to do. Um, but this thing is of the form X squared plus Y squared equals Z squared. And remember we're doing like plus one or zero or minus one. And I was kind of going from the Chinese finger trap to kind of being stretched into a, to the point where there was just a single point holding the thing together, namely an elliptic cone. And then that thing popped apart into the hyperboloid of two sheets. And I just wanted to show you kind of an animated version of that. So uh, if I start this thing at five, for instance, okay, see it's starting to shrink, then it gets down to zero and that thing kind of pops apart. Do you see that? So C is what I'm kind of adding to that right-hand side. You see what's happening here? And you can kind of look in here and see that the thing is that Chinese finger trap is getting stretched into oblivion once you get to zero. And that's the, the cone shape. And then eventually it pops apart into those two hyperboloids of two sheets. And what do you think is gonna happen again if I switch up these variables right here? here? Let me pause this so it will actually let me do it. If I switch up some variables in here, like for instance, right now I have Z on the right-hand side. So everything is kind of oriented with Z in the center, right? What if I made this variable over here Y instead? Well, you could probably predict that that's just going to have the effect of uh, orienting everything in the direction of the y-axis now. Yeah, so if I kind of hit enter on that, and now you can kind of see that it's all about the y-axis now, yes? If I were to, if I play that thing, it's going to do the same thing with y kind of at its center, yes? That's kind of a cool thing to behold for sure. The book doesn't spend any time on trying to relate the surfaces to one another, but I think it's sort of helpful to think about it in this way three of those quadric surfaces really kind of flow naturally into one another. Okay, and uh, so you have the hyperboloid of one sheet, the elliptic cone, and the hyperboloid of two sheets naturally flowing into each other. And we had the ellipsoid, and what else do we have? We had the, uh, the elliptic paraboloid, which was kind of the bowl-shaped looking thing, yes? Looked like this, so I go z equal to x squared, plus y squared. I'll just let this thing play in the background. You can see both of these. There's the elliptic paraboloid. See that? Yeah. And then we also had the uh, elliptic 
or actually the hyperbolic paraboloid where this thing changes to a minus instead. And you had that crazy looking mountain pass looking thing. Yes, kind of the saddle point in the middle. Okay, some, some cool stuff. Those were the six main quadric surfaces that I want you to be aware of. Okay, any questions on that? Again, their names are coming from the ways in which we slice these. Like what, what sorts of, what sorts of curves do I get if I slice through horizontally or vertically? What sorts of curves am I getting? And sometimes you'll slice one way and you'll get parabolas and you'll slice the other way and you'll get ellipses, for instance. That's why you would call it an elliptic paraboloid, yeah? In the case of this being plus, it's an elliptic paraboloid, okay? And uh, you can kind of see why. If I, if I look at things this way, right, if I slice horizontally, I don't know, like through Z equal to two, for instance, you can see that I'm getting ellipses, basically circles in this case, yes? But on the other hand, if I slice through at uh, vertically, like, I don't know, maybe I do Y equal to two or something. Uh, maybe I'll do Y equal to one, just so it's easier to see, okay? Then as you can see, you get parabolas, yes? Which is kind of neat, yeah? And you get different things if you're slicing through those, those other quadric surfaces, okay? Anyways, I just want you to be aware of that. I want you to have a nice feel for what's happening in three-dimensional space. This is a topic that will be revisited with great vigor in Calc 3, okay? We'll talk a lot about graphing surfaces and how slight, like thinking about the rib structure of the surface is kind of the key to graphing them. The rib structure is basically like the top topographical mapping of what's happening. We call those the level curves of the surface. Those form the rib structure of the, uh, of the three-dimensional graph, okay? Questions? Any questions? I think this kind of stuff is cool, honestly. Um, you know, I don't know if you can tell or not. Uh, you know, I'm sitting here behind plexiglass, you know, messing around with equations and whatnot. But I mean, I really do. I think this stuff's beautiful. Um, it's cool to think about, and it's it's sort of natural in some sense. It's a natural extension of, of what we were doing in two-dimensional space, okay? All of our work there prepared us for this. All right, let's talk about the next section, which is on cylindrical and spherical coordinates. Now, we, we already talked about one particular coordinate system. Well, what was it? Like one particular coordinate system we spent at least a couple sections on. What, what was that coordinate system? Polar. We spent all our time before that, like all of our, our high school years, kind of even maybe beginning college years, uh, talking about the Cartesian or rectangular coordinate system, yeah? So we, then we introduced the concept of polar coordinates. That was still living in two-dimensional space, correct? Now we're going to up the ante to three-dimensional space. We're gonna say, are there other ways to represent coordinates in three-dimensional space that aren't just rectangular? Technically speaking, it's not proper to call the coordinate system in three-dimensional space rectangular because you're not really talking about rectangles anymore. You're talking about boxes. Like a point X, Y, Z is always like the corner of a box that you could form. Here's kind of a picture of what I have in my mind right now. So if I do, right, if this is the point X and this is the point Y and uh, this is the point Z uh, and I want to graph the point X, Y, Z, it's right here, yeah? And technically speaking, this is, this is the corner of a box. Don't you see? Yeah, right there. Okay. It's the corner of a box. So it's almost like a box coordinate system. You can kind of say rectangular prism coordinate system. But most of the time, people just say the Cartesian coordinate system again, just so that it's more brief. Okay. But this is the point x, comma, y, comma, z. Okay. So the question is, are there other ways to represent points in three-dimensional space other than just the box coordinate system, yeah? Uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, in fact, uh, cylindrical coordinates, as we will discover, is, uh, is basically just the polar coordinates in three-dimensional space, okay? What you basically do is you kind of convert X and Y 
to the polar coordinates and then Z just stays what it is. That's it. That's really the entire, the entirety of the cylindrical coordinate system. You essentially convert X and Y to polar and Z stays what it was. But then there's another system we're gonna talk about called the spherical coordinate system. And that my friends is, is something new and exciting. Although components of it really do come from the polar coordinate system, okay? For instance, we had theta in the polar coordinate system, yeah? We're also gonna have theta in the spherical coordinate system and it's gonna be the same theta uh, that we had before, okay? All right, so let's, uh, Let's, let's, let's go through this. So uh, we're gonna first talk about cylindrical coordinates. I think that's what I'm basically just going to deal with today. And then we'll talk about spherical coordinates later on. Okay, but this will give us a couple of three-dimensional alternatives for coordinate systems. Lots of surfaces are simply easier to deal with if we use different coordinate systems. Okay, spheres, cylinders, and uh, surfaces like that are easier to deal with. By the way, there's, I, I'm only gonna, I'm introducing you to just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, polar is one, talk about cylindrical, spherical is gonna be another one we're gonna talk about, but it turns out that not even, like there's even more convenient coordinate systems for other kinds of surfaces. Uh, there's things called the hyperbolic coordinate system that involves something called the hyperbolic trig functions, not the ordinary circular trig functions that we deal with. Uh, but it turns out there's hyperbolic coordinate system that's also uh, fairly convenient at times, okay? There's also an elliptical coordinate system, elliptical coordinate system. Um, so uh, we're just kind of introducing some of the basics and preparing ourselves to understand maybe some of that later on, should the need arise, okay? So here's what a cylindrical coordinate system is. Point P in space is represented by an ordered triple R, theta, Z. Well, what are R and theta? Well, we know what R and theta are, okay? R and theta is the polar representation of the projection P into the X, Y plane, okay? And Z is, is just the directed distance from R theta. What do I mean by directed distance? So I have R theta in the X, Y plane. Directed distance, if Z is positive, I go up that amount. If Z is negative, I go down that amount, right? I mean, if Z is the same as it was in the regular old uh, box coordinate system. So let's, let me just kind of draw a picture here. Okay, so suppose uh, this is my point, X, Y, and Z, okay? And in the box coordinate system, I would go up to right here, yeah? Okay, I'm just gonna draw the box in here for reference sake. Okay, so there's X, Y, Z. Okay, and by the way, if I look at the projection, what they mean by projection is they mean the, the kind of thinking about this point as being projected down into the X, Y plane, yes? So that point right there has coordinates X comma Y, okay? This point right here on the other hand, that point has coordinates X, Y, Z before we get into any of the polar stuff at all. But down here in the X, Y plane, you know that there was this, uh, this system that we came up with, right? There was this angle right here that we called the angle with the positive x-axis that we called theta. And the length of this, the length of this, okay, hypotenuse, that's what we called r, right? And so we basically said, you know, this point we could also refer to as r comma theta, okay? And similarly, this point we could think of as r comma theta, comma Z. Now I hesitate to write equals right here. And I wrote, I wrote this corresponds. I hesitate to write equals because I'm really talking about a different set of coordinates now, yeah? I don't want you to get confused and think that X is the same as R and Y is the same as theta. Um, but that point we can represent by R, theta, Z, where R and theta are exactly the same as they were in the, uh, in the polar coordinate system, okay? 
Does that make sense? I mean, literally you're just swapping out X, Y, Z for R theta Z, yeah? So X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, you just swap out for uh, R theta Z. And like, what was the, what were the relationships between X, X, R and theta? What was, what was X equal to? X was R cosine theta. What was Y? R sine of theta. And you also had these other relationships, like the fact that tangent of theta was equal to Y over X. If you think about taking Y over X right now, that's gonna be uh, sine over cosine, which is tangent of theta, yeah? And you also knew that R squared was equal to X squared plus Y squared. Okay, and in this way, we can kind of go back and forth between the rectangular and the polar coordinate system, okay? So we're well familiar with this. There's nothing like brand spanking new going on here other than the fact that we're living in three-dimensional space. We've done nothing to Z. We've just left it alone, yeah? Okay, R theta will help us locate a point in the XY plane, and then Z tells us how far to go up and up or down depending on whether Z is positive or negative. That's it, okay? Any questions on that? I mean, you might say to yourself, good grief. I mean, why are we even calling this anything other than just the polar coordinate system? Well, by sort of updating the language to cylindrical coordinates, you automatically communicate to someone else that you're now living not in two-dimensional space, but three three-dimensional space. Now the z-axis is in play, okay? All right, so let's, uh, let's take a look at this. Converting between cylindrical and rectangular is just like with polar, as we already mentioned. We have x equal to r cosine of theta. We have y equal to r sine of theta. Okay, we have tangent theta equal to y over x. Right, and so I guess, I, I guess the, in theory, I should say theta is equal to the arc tangent of y over x, okay? We also have r squared equals to x squared plus y squared, okay? And you have to be careful about negatives and positives as you recall. And of course, z, hey, that's just z, right? <laughs> z just stays equal to itself. There's nothing new going on there, okay? So you can kind of uh, convert around with these various equations that we've already come up with, all right? So uh, I want you to work on this with your uh, with people around you. Express four minus pi five in rectangular coordinates. So in other words, this is in cylindrical coordinates. This is in cylindrical coordinates. And this guy is in rectangular coordinates. This guy is in rectangular coordinates. So I want you to convert those points to an appropriate rectangular and cylindrical coordinate representation, respectively. Okay, so please work on that for a couple of minutes. All right, so what do you have for me? Four minus pi, five. What's that gonna be? Four minus pi, five. Okay, so uh, four, that means, right? So for this one, that means that R is four, and what's theta? <laughs> Negative pi, which by the way, it doesn't matter whether theta is pi or minus pi in this case, does it? Yeah, it's gonna put us at the same place in, in, with relationship to the, the x and the y axis. Okay, so four, that means you're four away from the origin at an angle of negative pi, which means in the x, y plane, where are you? Where are you in the x, y plane? Uh, four, four directly to the left, right? Isn't that correct? Yeah. Okay, but that's just the x and the y coordinate. So this, so the x and the y would just be negative four comma zero, correct? <laughs> so what does this correspond to in the rectangular coordinates? Negative four, zero, five. Yeah, okay. 
Now, uh, X and Y four. So in this in this in this guy right here, I have X and Y equal to four. X equals four. Y equals four. Yeah. So you kind of know that tangent of theta is y over x, which in this case is just one. So what angle, and remember, uh, when we compute arc tangent, we typically wanna think of angles, and by, and by the way, you just have to pick out a correct angle, correct? If x and y are both four, you're in the first quadrant. And we want an angle such that sine and cosine are the same, basically. That's what this is saying. Tangent theta is equal to sine over cosine. It would have to be the same for that ratio to be one. What angle does that happen at? 45 degrees, yeah. Okay. Now, what about R? Well, yeah, R squared is equal to 16 plus 16, which means R is square root of 32, yeah? Okay. I don't know. I mean, you could write square root of 32. You could write that as square root of two times square root of 16, which is four square root of two, if you really wanted to be clever about things. Yeah? So I don't know. Uh, this guy right here corresponds to r equal to four square root of two, theta equal to pi over four, and z is z. Yeah? Now, is that the only way I could have expressed that point? No. We know there are an infinitude of ways to express a point in the polar coordinates, and hence an infinitude of ways to express a point in the cylindrical coordinates. Right? You could have added 2 pi to pi over 4. I could have even done weird stuff, like go to 5 pi over 4 and then used a negative radius. Remember that? Yeah? Could have used 5 pi over 4. I mean, you know, I'm telling you, uh, I could have also done, uh, I hesitate to write equals. Another way to write this would have been negative four square root of two, five pi over four, which is over in the third quadrant and 10, right? But that, that would have just been crazy. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm just trying to confuse you when I do that, right? Uh, it's best to just kind of pick out the simplest way possible to express a point. Any questions on that? Okay. How do you write a horizontal plane? A horizontal plane. How do I write a horizontal plane? Usually, we were just doing this yesterday. We were kind of slicing through with horizontal planes. Right? The most obvious horizontal plane is the XY plane. Right? So let me just say, we're like the xy plane basically corresponds to z equal to, that's just the plane that's described by z being zero, yes? And x and y can just do whatever they want. z is zero, x and y do anything. That's gonna give you the xy plane. So what about any old horizontal plane? How would I represent that? Well, X and Y would just be free, yeah? The only thing that would be restricted if I'm in a horizontal plane is Z. Z would just have to be at a particular height. So it's just Z equal to some kind of constant. So this is just a constant, okay? Z equal to five would be the, be the horizontal plane parallel to the X, Y plane, five up on the Z axis. Z equal to minus five would be the Level plane parallel to the xy plane, five below the xy plane. Yes. Okay. So uh, let me just kind of go over here and let's look at this for just a minute. Okay. So, like, watch. I mean, z equal to one. You see it? There it is, right? That's parallel to the xy plane. Here, maybe I better put the xy plane back in here. Show plane. Okay, the good old xy plane is right there, yeah? I put z equal to negative one, of course, that's gonna just be below it, yeah? Okay, the xy plane is sandwiched in between those two, okay? So, any horizontal plane 
is just going to be given by z equals to some kind of constant. How would you write that in cylindrical? Same, yeah? Okay, so this is same in both cylindrical and rectangular or box coordinates. How do you write vertical planes containing the Z axis? Vertical planes that contain the Z axis. Okay, so what I mean are what I mean is something like uh, like this. Okay, so vertical planes that contain the z-axis. Uh, you know, well, actually, let me go. I'm gonna actually go uh, do this in the other thing over here. And okay, watch this. Oh boy! So let me get rid of these two guys. Vertical planes that contain the z-axis. Well, basically, like y equal to x would do that. Yeah. See this thing? Any line that I can write down in the xy plane that passes through the origin is going to contain the z-axis, correct? Okay. Another one would be like y equal to zero, for instance. Yeah? Another one would be, uh, you know, uh, x, x equal to zero. That would also work. x equal to zero. Yeah, do you see all these planes right here? These like vertical planes that happen to contain the z-axis. Another one would be like y equal to negative 2x, for instance. Okay, look at all those. Those are pretty cool, right? It's like a bunch of pages hinged at the z-axis. All right, do you remember uh, for lines that went through the origin, how did I describe those in the... Uh, polar coordinates. So, for instance, if I had y equal to x, the line y equal to x, well, come on, you, you guys know that tangent of theta is equal to y over x, correct? Yeah? And therefore, if y is equal to x, okay, if y is equal to x, then that would mean that tangent of theta was actually, right, this is if y happens to be, if I happen to be in line y equal to x, tangent of theta is always one. And therefore I would describe that line by theta equal to the angle that gives tangent being one, yeah? So theta equal to pi over four was a way to do that, right? And in general, if I have y equal to mx, okay? And I know that tangent of theta is equal to y over x, then really what I do is I plug in what y is, and what am I gonna get? Tangent theta equals what? Think about it, if I put in y equal to mx, I'm gonna get tangent theta equal to m, yes? And therefore theta, to describe this thing in the polar coordinates, it would just be theta equal to arc tangent of m. Okay, and remember, I can take the arctangent of any number because actually tangent achieves every possible uh, negative and positive number, yeah, and even zero for that matter, okay? So theta is going to be the arctangent of whatever that slope happens to be, okay? Therefore, uh, how would I describe, how would I describe these planes? Well, like this. All I have to do is just say what theta is and then that will automatically determine a line through the origin, correct? I take it for all radii, but then Z is free and it's gonna sketch out these planes right here, okay? So like Y equal to X, for instance, that's just going to be theta equal to pi over four. That's how I would describe that, even in the cylindrical coordinates. What about Y equal to zero? Well, that's going to be, so think about it. If Y is zero, what's theta going to be? Theta equals, What's theta going to be equal in this case? Theta is going to be arc tangent of zero. What is what is the angle whose tangent is zero? Zero. Okay. X equal to zero. X equal to zero. 
what is what is that going to correspond to in the cylindrical coordinates, i.e., polar coordinates? Theta equal to. Now think about it, right? So the line is now kind of the y-axis. What angle is that going to be? Theta equal to 90 degrees. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What about y equal to negative 2x? Well, that's going to correspond to the arc theta. Oops. Theta is going to be the arc tangent of what? Negative two. Uh, which, whatever that happens to be, I don't even know what that is, right? But there is an arc tangent of negative two for sure. I can put anything in here, right? So all of these planes are simply described by the angle theta. Uh, down in the xy plane. Z is free to roam. R is free to kind of move around on that line. Yeah, so that line uh, through the origin gets described simply by the angle that that line makes with the positive x-axis. Okay. Any questions on that? I think this is kind of a cool little, little picture to look at, right? So we've described all of these lines uh, in the cylindrical coordinates by just appealing to what we know about polar. Okay. All right. Back over here. How to write vertical planes containing the z-axis? Well, it's going to be, uh, you know, if, if y is equal to mx, like we said, right up here, it was z equal to a constant, y equals mx. Uh, we know that tangent of theta is equal to y over x which is equal to mx over x, which is m. So theta is going to be arc tangent of m. Okay, there was one plane over there that didn't quite fit this, uh, uh, you know, like the formula for x equal to zero, we, we had to do, we had to just think about it. And we said, well, theta then has to be pi over two, 90 degrees, okay? Any questions on that? Okay. All right, so go ahead and work on this for a minute then, all right, with someone next to you. Convert these things to rectangular. Convert these things to rectangular. Okay, and then we'll reconvene in a couple of minutes. All right, do you... Do you guys remember what the first thing would be if we were to sketch it just in the xy plane, like the r equal to two cosine theta? Do you guys remember what that might be? What that's going to sketch out? Okay, it's a circle. It's a circle of diameter two that kind of starts at two zero and then goes back to the origin and it kind of has the point one comma zero as, right? So if I were to sketch this, if I were to sketch this in the xy plane, it would look like this, right? So here's two, and this thing would go like this. I don't know if you remember that or not, okay? The way that you could kind of see that is by multiplying this by r, and you would get r squared equals two r cosine theta, right? I multiply by r because I wanna see r cosine theta, not just cosine theta, yeah? So how does that convert? What's r squared equal to? Yeah, it's x squared plus y squared. And what's that equal to? 2x, yeah? Right, and, and this is the equation of a circle, believe it or not. You would have to like move 2x over. It would be minus 2x plus 1 plus y squared equals 1 if you complete the square. And you would see that this is the equation of a circle, x minus 1 squared plus y squared equals one, yeah? Uh, but the first form right there is perfectly adequate. Um, so that's what, that's what that one ends up being. Let me erase this, uh, this picture up here. Let's think about this other one. One thing I would remind you of is that cosine of two theta, if you will recall, cosine of two theta, I don't know if you recall this, but we're, I'm trying to remind you of stuff that you'll probably need to remember for the final. So-called double angle formula for cosine of two theta so that I can get it down to just thetas and deal with it that way. 
cosine of two theta is equal to cosine squared of theta minus sine squared of theta. And if I, if I plug that in here, okay, if I plug that in here, I'm gonna get zero on this side. I'll have z squared minus one, and I'll have r squared times cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta. This is plus z squared minus one, yeah? And if I distribute this r squared through, what am I gonna end up with? Think about it, I'll have r squared cos squared theta, which, what is that? What? Yeah, that's x squared. So it'd be x squared minus y squared plus z squared minus one equals zero. That looks a lot like something we studied yesterday, doesn't it? Think about it. Because you have x squared plus z squared equals y squared plus one. You see what I mean? Doesn't that look like one of the quadric surfaces we studied yesterday? Okay. Which one is that? Think about it. I have x squared plus z squared equals y squared plus one. What's that? This hyperbola to one sheet, the Chinese finger trap. But how's it gonna be oriented since it's y squared over with the plus one instead of z, z squared? It's gonna be oriented not about the z axis, but the y axis, makes sense? So that's going to be the Chinese finger trap with y axis right in the middle. And this guy right here is a little bit more interesting. I have just the circle in the x, y plane, but then z is free, you know what I'm saying? Z is free to do what it wants. And therefore you're gonna get not just the circle, but a cylinder, yeah? I mean, a cylinder, look how easy it was to express that cylinder. It was just R equal to two cosine theta. That's why these are called the cylindrical coordinates. Okay, so let's go over here and graph these couple of things uh, just for our own personal joy and comfort here. Okay, so let's see. Uh, so what was it? It was x squared plus z squared or plus z squared equals y squared plus one. Yeah, that was one of them. It isn't just isn't it just exactly what we were thinking? Yeah, you see that? Y axis is right in the middle, right there. It's the hyperboloid of one sheet oriented about the y axis. And the other one was x squared plus what? Plus y squared equals 2x, correct? And you can kind of see what that is, right? It's, you can see the cylinder right there. And okay, let me get rid of this hyperboloid of two sheets. Let me erase the writing on here, okay? You see this? Look. It's, it's the circle uh, you know, of, of diameter two, radius one centered at the point one comma zero in the x-axis, but then z is free, which then extends this into an infinite cylinder above that circle and above and below that circle, okay? So that's kind of cool to think about. So here are both of these things just for, for us to kind of have them both on there at the same time. That's pretty cool, right? Pretty cool. I, I'm gonna color this one differently. Color. Let's go with blue, okay? Yeah, cool, all right? Cool, yes, Michael. Does that infinite cylinder, does it have one hole or two holes? One, what do you mean? Well, like, like, is it like each end is a hole or is it one hole and it's just It's just a giant, it's a giant tube that just goes yeah, on forever. Exactly. It's just a, a question about does it have one hole or two holes? <laughs> I don't know that it really has, uh, I mean, I guess even an ordinary cylinder just has one hole technically, yes? <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> you wouldn't see, if I like fell through the middle of a giant toilet paper roll, I wouldn't say, oh, I just fell through two holes. I would say I fell through one hole, yeah? So yeah, okay. So you learn something new every day. It's a good, good question, okay. Uh, <laughs>
All right, I think that was all I had. Oh, so like I, so I just wanted to show you this. We'll do spherical coordinates uh, next, a little bit next time, but I do want to spend time reviewing. So again, these are just some basic surfaces. X squared plus Y squared minus Z squared equals one. The way that would be written in the cylindrical coordinates is, uh, you know, R squared equals Z squared plus one. That, so that it gets expressed a little bit more easily. Here is like, <clears throat> here's the elliptic cone. Okay, look how easy that is to, to reduce. It's just R equal to Z. Man, how easy is that, right? Uh, here is a paraboloid. Okay, so like Z basically equals a constant times X squared plus Y squared. Um, replace X squared plus Y squared with R squared and you end up with, with this rendering of this in the cylindrical coordinates. Finally, like X squared plus Y squared is equal to R squared. Take the square root and this, this thing reduces to R equal to three, this cylinder does. Look how trivial cylinders are to express in the cylindrical coordinates. Not surprisingly, that's why they're called the cylindrical coordinates for crying out loud, yeah? Okay, so there's just some uh, fairly, fairly standard uh, kinds of surfaces that you would express in the cylindrical coordinates, okay? Cool, we will talk about spherical coordinates next time, that's it.